participants, I propose that we start. It's three o'clock in Almaty, and this is our 11th webinar on museum professionals capacity development. And in this cycle, we have already had quite a few events, and we are recording each of those. So, and we post them to our YouTube page. Now you have this link to the playlist. You can see the lists or records of the previous webinars if you haven't seen them yet. Unfortunately, most of our speakers are Russian speakers. So it's uh, uh, on, only one webinar has been translated into English when we have these dual speakers. All the others are in Russian. I mean, those recorded webinars. But uh, we are going to continue. Uh, We're going to go on. We have a, quite a few webinars scheduled for museum professionals. And all info on those events will be available in the next few weeks in our social networks, in our website. So please uh, subscribe to track the news of this project uh, or any other projects as well. Now, our today's webinar is a second one organized uh, with the Secretariat of ICOM, the International Council of Museums. ICOM has uh, courteously found quite a few unique international specialists experienced in uh, this area. And their experience will be very useful and interesting for the museum specialists of our region, Central Asia and the Caucasus. So before I introduce our current speakers, I would like to give the floor to our colleague and representative of the ICOM Secretariat in Paris, Carlos Eduardo Serrano, Program Coordinator for Capacity Development. Carlos, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Major. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I am Carlos Serrano, Capacity Building Coordinator of ICOM, uh, working here at the Secretariat. Um, uh, first, I want to thank uh, UNESCO office in Almaty for inviting us uh, to organize together uh, these webinars. And I would also like to thank um, our International Committee, ICOM CC, this is the International Committee for Conservation, because it was through them that we found these unique um, speakers that, that we will have today and that we had um, uh, last week. Um, very briefly, I will speak a little bit about ICOM. Um, what is ICOM? Is the, uh, the International Council of Museum is the only the, the only international organization of museum professionals. We have around 49,000 um, museum professionals uh, as members of, of, of ICOM. And last week we were talking about some of the benefits of being part of ICOM. Uh, we were discussing how to stay informed and uh, through ICOM publications or the, the different partnerships that ICOM have with other uh, publishing houses. Um, today, I just wanted to tell you about the training opportunities that our members or the museum professionals have through ICOM. We have the, an international training center for museum studies uh, in China. It's a partnership with the Palace Museum and with ICOM China. And, we were, and with them, we developed about two um, training workshops per year for international uh, participants in different topics, conservation, education, uh, exhibition development, etc. Of course, due to the pandemic, we, the, 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 these workshops are still, uh, for the moment, in standby, but we hope that in the following year we will uh, continue with these uh, successful workshops. We also have regional workshops that we, uh, we developed um, by continent, so we have developed some training workshops in Latin America, in Africa, um, probably very soon in, in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. Um, so these are workshops where all uh, museum professionals from the same region can get together and discuss the challenges that they have in certain uh, uh, sectors of the, of, the, of the museum profession. We also have exchange programs. We have developed some exchange program between Africa and Switzerland and probably uh, very soon from, from Africa 
uh, to Germany and the other way around. Uh, this has been very successful and we are open to uh, any other organization that might be interested in participating in this exchange program. Very soon we will have a, a MOOC um, about inclusion. Um, and of course, we also have other online programs like this webinar that we are, uh, to, uh, we are participating today. And uh, recently, we just um, signed an agreement with the University of Shanghai for the, for the creation of the International Museum of Research and Exchange Center. This is, uh, um, it, it is more uh, an academic and uh, scientific uh, initiative that we will uh, start very soon. Um, another benefit is all the support that ICON gives to museum professionals and to the projects developed by museum professionals. First, we have travel grants and subsidies for, uh, for, the, for the, our members to participate uh, in the international committees events, or, but also, and also to the ICOM General Conference. This through the ICOM grants uh, um, program or together with other partner institutions like, in, like we did in 2019 for the conference in Japan uh, that we offer travel grants together with the Getty Institute. And we also, every year, we support the projects of our national committees um, or international committees uh, uh, through the SAREC uh, grant system. And for this year, last year and this year, we had also another type of grants called the Solidarity Funds that it was um, a, that, that aiming to support museums in, the, in this kind of crisis uh, due to the pandemic. Then um, this is more or less what I wanted to, to show you today. Um, if you want to be part of ICOM, you can contact your national committees. And if there is no national committees committee in your country, uh, you can contact uh, directly the secretariat uh, at, the, um, at the email that you see in the, on the bottom, memberships arroba, uh, at ICOM about museum. Okay, this is all that I wanted to share today. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you also to, to Andrea and to Marlene to, for being here together with us. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Carlos. I would like to add for everyone, uh, for all museum professionals and specialists, as well as for organizations, uh, of course, the webinars that we offer are not just uh, capacity development. Uh, uh, this is also about providing some basic uh, things that you might be interested in. As for more long-term or sustainable capacity development, I think ICOM is probably the best international tool or way to develop this capacity, this potential. So that's why we call everyone to collaborate with ECOM. Uh, with, they have a lot of interesting program and exciting projects, and we are going to mention them during our other webinars as well. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ms. Andrea Pataki, who is a professor from the University of Cologne uh, on the conservation studies at the Cologne Institute, University of Applied Sciences. She's going to talk about paper, textile conservation, or things made from textile in museum environment. Thank you, Andrea, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, thank you very much. Uh, well, at, at this time we, we talk about paper conservation and I think textile was another <laughs> another topic. These are in, in German, these are two, two disciplines. So I'm uh, on, the, on the paper conservation uh, background and I would share my screen. Yes, I would like to apologize. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're talking uh, about to talk about paper conservation, not textile. This is my apologies. These uh, textile things we had at the previous uh, webinar and it's already uh, records are available. Today we're going to talk about papers. <laughs> That's very good. So, okay, thank you very much for the introduction and I'm uh, I, want, uh, I want to thank very much for this uh, great offer to talk here for the UNESCO uh, Almaty Cluster Office and also for, for, um, for the ICOM, ICOM who, who, um, who made the path uh, that I can talk to you. Um, I'm very happy to talk about paper conservation. 
um, I, I'm, I can introduce myself a little bit, my background. Then I thought about 40 minutes um, to talk about works of art on paper. And there is the handling of artwork, a little bit dry cleaning and mounting would be a topic. Then we can have time for first questions. And then, then we change the setup because my colleague, Marlene Bernkin, she will come and we go together through the conservation lab. And we make a, a short, <laughs> a short um, demonstration. And then we have time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, me, myself, I'm a, a trained handcraft bookbinder because in Germany, you always have book and paper conservation in one hand. And then I studied book and paper conservation in Stuttgart at the um, um, State Academy of Art and Design. And then I was in the States with the German Academic Exchange Program at the Walters Art Museum and then uh, followed my PhD and I worked a lot with consolidation of friable pigments and inks. And, um, and since uh, four years now, I'm here um, a professor at the Cologne Institute of Conservation Sciences. And we cover everything which, is to, which has to do with paper, uh, boards, uh, graphic works of art on paper, um, but also book, books, manuscripts, parchments. This is the whole range of um, cellulose or protein-based materials. So I hope you find yourself and you have, any, if you question, please write them down um, and we can try to answer them at the end. Uh, today, I would like to talk about works of art on paper. We say also flatware, it's uh, the, 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 the flat paper works. It, they can be historic from 14th, 15th century or, um, or modern uh, papers. What's very crucial when looking at paper conservation is the handling because we have a very a soft and open material. So I would like to show a little bit the, the, the artwork, the handling, and then looking at dry cleaning to, to how, how to unsoil a paper. So to, to, to put away uh, soiling from above, it's dust or anything which is coming. So the tools which we do have, and then look, looking a little bit on mounting of works of art on paper. So what kind of cardboard you're using and if you're using class or perspex, this is always the two big questions you want to resolve yourself. So paper um, is, is the support for the, for the artwork and paper has a very long tradition as you, as you know, and you have, your paper was always, always can be divided in a, it was for documentate, documentation purposes. So it was in high as an archival, a purpose, so for documentation, um, for um, for writing down something, for legal issues, this is always the one part, or, or as an artistic purpose. So it was as an as an arts and crafts uh, for, um, for 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 artists to express themselves. Then you have a, a whole range of uh, printing techniques, but then also. Uh, working with with, uh, with with colored media. So you have a high variety of materials, but always the support is out of uh, paper. In paper, you have, uh, again, the big division between handmade and industrial paper. Normally, in our case, the most objects we, we do have, they are from handmade papers because these are the older ones. And the industrial paper starts with um, uh, 19th century. Um, what is fiber? Fiber is a very open fiber web. Uh, web. It's, um, you know it, here's my, my, I have my little notes. So this is an industrial paper, but the old paper is much more open. It's, uh, it's made out of cellulose and it can be um, made out of cotton or hemp, flex or recycled cotton. So in former times they've used the old um, wearings to produce um, paper again bust fibers you have or in nowadays or nowadays also wood fibers this is the basic material you have and then you have a lot of additives on plus on that this can be lining so for example if i want to write on my paper these are my little notes for my schedule today if this wouldn't be sized if there wouldn't be a coating on it i couldn't write so you always have a liming any kinds of liming, there are historical limings, 
or um, a kind of clue, you can say. Then you have a filler. So this is uh, in, in late times, this has been calcium carbonate to make the paper heavier, to make it more valuable. But then you can also have surface coatings. So something you brushed on top of it um, or dye. So it's a little bit brownish or more reddish. So you have all kinds of additives in the paper, which normally the people are not so aware of, but this is very important to know. And that's the next reason that you always need to look very closely to your, to your paper and look very exactly what, what, do, what do you have, and if, especially if you want to conserve it or want to make conservation treatment. So you have always a, a cellulose base made out of different materials, hemp, flax, uh, best fibers or wood fibers in nowadays and but then still not to forget a lot of material material you, do, you don't see it at first glance but which is existence as well that means paper is a very open material it attracts dust it attracts soiling it's flexible uh, it's hygroscopic and hygroscopic means that it takes up moisture and humidity from the environment but can also dry out. So here today we have perhaps 40% relative humidity and this is not too humid. So a paper will rather dry out than take up um, humidity. It's vulnerable, it can be teared, it can be, it can be torn. So it's a sensible, it's a sensitive material and it's, it's a lightweight. It's a, it's a light material other than uh, wood, for example, or stone. Or for example. So having all these paper characteristics in mind, we have a, an open, flexible, hygroscopic, lightweight material which we need to, to work uh, with. That's the reason that we normally always wear gloves to protect uh, the paper because we are, your arm, so you, you can have dirt hands, you have sweaty hands. So not to have any transfer material from your hands to the papers. Normally we, we, are, uh, we, are, um, we are wearing cloths and we always wrap our materials. We have um, papers, we make envelopes, we have boxes and this is very important. These are really the first steps in paper conservation, how to treat, how to handle your works of art on paper. And uh, these, for example, if we have here these, these blue envelopes, so we, we also want to know what these papers are made of. So these are um, very well papers who should long for last time. So they have no lignin, they have um, um, a pH a little bit higher than seven and they, they have dyes which are not bleeding. These envelopes we are then putting in, uh, in storage areas where they are stuff free and which, uh, where they can be handled in a very safe way. Then we normally we don't uh, handle the papers with the bare hands, so we always use spatulas or bamboo spatulas. You can you can um, make them yourself, and afterwards, if we go to the lab, you will see them. I can show you my my spatulas and my working tools. These bamboo spatula you can do for yourself, for example, if you cut it and and and. Um, and, um, and, and, and finish it uh, by sc scrubbing and you can make your own bamboo spatula because you normally we always want to lift something not with the bare hands but with a helping tool. Um, another way is always we box a lot of things so for example here on the right side on the on the picture you see uh, works of art on paper in a mount so the art of art, the works of art on paper is well secured in a in a mount. We say passepartout or a mount uh, with strong or with, with uh, thicker boards and also protected with the uh, interleaving paper. And these mounts are then again stored in boxes. And these boxes are also lightweight. They they are um, they are um, um, have, a, have a good aging characteristics, and they are called a microwave because they are lightweight. Uh, very, but, but very stable and um, have good aging characteristics. And normally we, everything is protected and uh, secured in uh, envelopes, mounts and boxes. So this is would be the way how to, how, to, how to work or how to store also works of art on paper. 
Um, this then can again um, put in drawers, uh, flat drawers normally, and then you have, then you also not put one single works of art on paper here, but you have a whole range of um, pieces. So perhaps you can store 50 or, or, or 60 single sheets in envelopes. And if you see here the drawers, you have here about 20, 30 uh, uh, drawers. So you have a high capacity of storing your, your, your objects. So this is very important. Um, the wrapping material, so this glue material or these envelopes, they should have a high quality and we define it because we say it should have alpha cellulose. So this is a good uh, purified cellulose. Although it's coming from trees or from wood, it's cleaned and only the, the, the best part of the cellulose, this is called the alpha cellulose, is present. You have an alkaline reserve, that means that this glue wrapping paper, so this here, um, it stays long, it has a long um, aging characteristics, and this is done by calcium carbonate. And it also has water resistant dyes, that means that if in any case you have a, a flood or a water um, hazard, um, the dyes here inside of the blue won't, um, won't penetrate from the blue envelope to your object. This would be the worst case you want uh, to avoid. So these dyes, uh, which are used, they're water resistant. So they're very well incorporated in this paper. So this is very important to have good envelopes, high quality envelopes and boxes and also storing materials in the, um, in the area where you're working. So we store our artworks in envelopes, in boxes, mounts, um, and in planner closets. We also want to have a clean environment. So it's very important that your storage area is cleaned, that someone is going through wet or dry cleaning, and that you have a good air exchange. Because if, if you are in a storage area where for half a year no one is walking through, or um, if nothing, if the air stands still, there's always the danger of having mold, clo mold clo uh, growth. And um, and, and to have fungi. So this is always um, a big problem. And it's also for the for air circulation, it's good also for the climate um, where you have also your rules. Um, for paper, you normally say 55 rel percentage relative humidity and um, um, a temperature about 20, 21 degrees Celsius. Um, yes, and then if you have, for example, if you have a whole stack of works of art on paper, normally you have larger amounts, you don't have single pieces, but larger amounts, so they are dusty normally or they are soiled, and um, you have very common tools to brush them or to, um, to work with them. So normally you have... Um, um, a brushes and, and two or three sorts of um, dry, dry cleaning uh, materials. Before looking at the, the tools to, to take up or to clean the paper, uh, we can look at the, what's, what might be on the paper, so dust or which kind of contamination. And there you uh, distinguish the particle size, so coarse dust. It's the bigger particles which are perhaps on the paper, uh, which you normally see in the fine dust. These are the two um, par particle sizes uh, which you have. And they're coming either from outside. Now it's springtime, so you have a lot of uh, flower, you have a lot of spores. Um, they're coming from, oh, sorry. They're coming from uh, outside. Uh, it might be also flower dust or also microbiotic substances or they have an anorganic origin. And then they, they are the abrasion uh, from the street, from cars, from the stones or sandstones um, where you're living. So you always divide the, the contamination from its origin. So either organic, then it's from plants um, or microbiotic substance or anorganic, then it's normally um, a smog or from cars and traffic. However, you want to remove it and you want to uh, uh, take it away. So you have all sorts of, of fine or, or, or coarse brushes. Uh, you can also use sometimes microfiber tissues 
And then a very common um, eraser, it's a polyvinyl chloride eraser with calcium carbonate or a latex sponges or cosmetic pads. I will quickly show you. You can also protect yourself because if you dust and if you take away um, material which is material material which is on your paper, you want to wear gloves, either cotton gloves or latex or natrile gloves. This is also a little bit of a personal um, situation which you want to have. And these are brushes, very common brushes, very slightly. You can go over your artwork and not rubbing, but take away a surface laying. Um, dust which is on your on your art, artwork as a, as a in the first instance. Um, here this is more um, standardized, I would say in more an industrial approach where you dust here as well with a brush, but the, the, the offcoming is directly uh, su sucked away. And um, this would be also if you if you use microfiber tissues, you can get them in more in the most of the stores. And this is a very um, very fine uh, material, and we, where you can take up also a dust and soiling. And um, I'm sure you will find it in a in a normal um, store in a normal normal store. Then you have this a plastic eraser, a PVC eraser. It's polyvinyl chloride rubber. Um, it's very good because it has no grinding material and a high percentage of calcium carbonate, which has which guarantees a good aging characteristic. And you can get them as a block or as these kind of mines. So they're very fine, and you can also shape them in the area which what you how you want to have them. This is the most common one uh, which we do have. Another one is the latex sponges. Uh, this is a natural product. It's produced from factis. Uh, it's not abrading and it's used as a block. I will show you afterwards. It's very soft, it's spongy. Uh, it needs to be stored in the dark because it changes its color. But as long as there are no material from the sponge stays on your object is no danger. So this is a very good. And this comes actually from wall painting uh, conservation where there or from or from fire um, uh, damages where you have to clean great areas. But they are also very suitable in paper conservation. And they are already a little spongy and a little bit, bit sticky. You can also use these cosmetic pads. They have also a very fine surface. Uh, where you can abrade and take off uh, dust or soiling on your paper surface. But the problem is that if you have crumbs or particles which are very fine, uh, which you see here in this, uh, at these white, these white particles, they can keep or stay in the fiber web, in the, in the fiber web. And this you want to definitely avoid. So that's the reason why you always want to have. Um, um, a gum or an erasure which can't stay in the paper. Or if it stays in the paper, then it needs to be a very good aging characteristics. And you don't, and you don't want to have that uh, particles from your erasure staying in the in the open paper um, surface. It's the reason uh, why it happens. So you have all you have many other um, erasers, but normally they. They lose particles and then they stay inside in the paper, which you don't, which you want to avoid. Okay, this would be already it was already the, the um, an idea about the um, a dry cleaning of paper, and now we can look at mounting of works of art on paper. So how how do you mount it? And there we have well, of first the cardboards. This is the, your supporting material. Then you have the hinging. So you have how to put your, 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 your work of art of paper on the board and how you protect it. So either with glass or perspex. And um, the cardboard should also meet museum standards. And that means again, you need to want to have alpha cellulose. So a very pure, high quality um, cellulose. You want to have a pH over seven and an alkaline reserve and no lignin. So you want to have a stable, a good image with good aging characteristics, um, such a board you want to have where you put or where you present your, your artwork. 
this is very important. And for hinging or for mounting, to connecting your work, work of art on paper on your support, normally you use Japanese paper strips. And there we have two ways. We have a V and a T hinges and you use wheat starch paste. It's a very common um, starch paste, which we cook normally ourselves. Uh, you buy the powder and then you put uh, water in it and you, you cook it one time and then the, the cold um, paste you use to hinge your artwork. Um, and for hinges, if you have your Japanese paper, this is a very a very durable and very is a standard material. Uh, you have several ways of to prepare your hinges. Um, here on the lower left side, it's just cut with a with a scissor. However, these are very hard. Oh, there's very hard edges, and therefore you want to shape your edges a little bit because this side is glued on your paper, and to have a smooth. Over, um, over overlapping area, you fray it. This you can fray by with a water cut. I will show you afterwards. And this can be done in various various areas. So this is a water cut, a purely water cut. There is a water cut which is already uh, um, um, taken away the long fibers. And this is like like a stencil um, where you put. It. Always the 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 goal is to have a smooth sur area. Um, with a soft edge. And this you can um, provide by tearing it with a water cut. And this is very, very important if you glue this area on your original um, paper. Um, and this is how it looks like. So here you have your, your, your mount. Um, and here's your, your object. And there you have the hinge. This is called the V hinges. And um, so this is the upper side of your object. Here's um, an area of, with, with color or anything which you look, look. Here's your hinge and you don't see the hinge. So this is the V hinge. And um, here is, it looks like, so this is your paper, your artwork, and here is the, oh, and here the hinge is here glued to this area here. And this fraying out, which what we have seen here, this area, is then here at this side. Here on the board, you don't need to fray it. So you don't, you only need to fray it out or to, to soft edge um, at this part. Then you have also a T hinge. That means uh, you just glue um, a hinge here on the back side of your paper and make an, a, um, a rectang rectangular uh, strip over it. Um, this is the case if you, if you, um, if there's a mount or anything which can cover the whole object. And this though it looks then here like this. So you have, here's your artwork and here's a, a, a strip of Japanese paper and this is the second one. So this is the, uh, the two ways of mounting um, something. I will show you also in detail afterwards. And then you have the question always about class and perspex. Uh, that your goal is to protect your artwork, especially if you have color in it, if you have a watercolor or you have acrylic or colored medium on your paper, then you want to protect it. And therefore you can use a class or perspex. And there are some pro and cons about having the one or the other. So on the left side, we have um, parameters for class. So it is very clear. It has an, a nice shining. It can't be any, you can't have any scratches, scratches because it's very hard and you have a quite good protection um, against UV light. However, you have a high risk of breaking. You can imagine if it falls down and or if it's torn, you can have a, break, a, a breaking risk and it's a limit of size. Sometimes uh, you can't make um, an artwork with three meters or two meters with a glass um, front. This is too too heavy and too too difficult to uh, to handle it. So these would be then the reasons to use Perspex. With Perspex, um, you have a high protection against UV light. So you have a, a even better protection if you have a sensible um, media on your paper. There's rather no limit of size. You can cut it. It's much lighter than glass. Um, 
However, the back, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the negative aspect is that you has, have a risk of scratches. So this is more vulnerable. You have also, um, it can be also um, electric, um, it, um, no, um, transporting of, of electricity can be. Um, so this is a, these are the drawbacks of using uh, Perspex. Um, but ac actually, this is a whole whole area of um, of investigation and choosing the right material. But these are the basic ideas using glass and and perspex for protecting your artwork. Definitely, if you are in a museum installation um, and there is sunlight, so somehow you need to avoid that sunlight directly uh, confronts your artwork. So you want to have UV protection. Uh, normally, you you have it already in your in your uh, class into windows. So either they have already UV um, protection as a foil or or the class itself. Then you can also use curtains, and then you also protect your your artwork itself. And that the museum standard is that the light is not um, brighter than fifty lux. Nowadays, you can use already LED uh, lamps. They have also UV um, parts, but not as, as a high area than, than other uh, sources of, of light, such, such as halogen, for example. The, uh, the, the good uh, aspect from LEDs is that you have nearly no, no heat, um, uh, we have a very good heat control, there's nearly no heat, and um, you, have, you can control your climate in the museum in a better way than if you have the old standard uh, lamps. So this is uh, the, 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 the uh, you really need to avoid any uh, direct sunlight in a, in a graphic um, museum show, because there you have high, uh, high UV, percentages and these you, you want to avoid um, definitely. So either with your class of your museum outside window already or with curtains and then to protect your artwork again. And it's also one reason that if there's um, a show um, of a paperwork, this is not normally very dull and this is not, um, not much light around. But it, as soon as the visitor is used to the darker room, um, then you can also visit um, the artwork. And these are just some uh, some of the main companies. So you can, if you look about class, you can um, uh, you have standards like it should be anti reflective, and a mirror guard, for example, is a is a special protective class uh, where where two glass plates are glued together uh, that you have that you avoid the risk of breakage. Um, um, one very strong company who's, who's uh, selling or who's providing a Perspex is TrueView. I can show you also some examples uh, later in the lab. And this is a, um, a very good um, source, however, quite expensive. So it also depends on um, where to use it, when to use it, uh, on, what, on what occasion. But these are the, the, the big groups which you can think of. And it always depends on your um, of your financial background for an exhibition, uh, what what to use and size and, and any um, any parameters or any any ideas we were just talking about. Um, here, I just show you a few a few examples of paper conservation, which we can't go in detail now because this is too short. But this is a very popular and old um, lithograph, a colorimetic a color um, a lithograph. Tears, uh, lots of tears, uh, abrasion. So we washed it, uh, cleaned it, made it infills, and then also performed a retouching. So this is a very typical way of paper conservation. I wanted to show you here as well. You have um, an intaglio printing where the whole edge is uh, missing, and this was um, a former student of us who leaf casted here this paper. So she added a new paper. Um, and toned it in, and actually, then if it comes to an exhibition, only this area will be will be shown. So this area you won't see it. Also, not the stains. Um, so this is a very good way of showing. This, for example, is a cleaning of a work of art on paper. Um, there's a mud on it because it was um, a river going 
going into an AM, into a storage area. And this was a very strong cleaning action. So we needed to take away all these mud incrustations which heavily stuck to the paper. So this was a very difficult um, um, handling and conservation work. Okay, so there would be time perhaps for, um, for first questions if you have, or if you want to add something, or if you have, um, uh, or if you have already for the last uh, 40 minutes something to, to say, or if, if there's something you, you want to add here, is there a um, possibility that people are asking something? Dear participants, as far as I understand, uh, the chat box has no questions or comments to this date. So let's uh, give you some time. If nobody responds, we will move on. But, oh, okay, somebody is uh, gathering or collecting their thoughts probably. Before that, before we move on, I will let me share the information on our next webinar, which is going to take place tomorrow. And now the chat box is being filled up with information in two languages about the title, the speaker, and how to get registered to that webinar. So you see it in the chat box. And this is on current multimedia technologies, which attract, train, and attract museum visitors. So this is going to be tomorrow at two o'clock p.m. Almaty time. And our speaker will have Alexander Lachov who is an editor or an author of more than 200 multimedia projects. He is the winner of more than 30 museum competitions. Now, unless you have comments or questions, Andrea, please, let's move on. Let's proceed uh, and get to uh, whatever we have. Okay, I will switch the room and go to uh, Marlene and we will show you the, uh, the lab. A little bit. Okay. Now, our participants, uh, let me share them. What is going to happen now? Ms. Pataki is going to show the lab, and her colleague Marlene is going to shoot her on the video uh, on the telephone, and Ms. Pataki is going to um, offer you a small tour. Yes. Uh, please make sure. Can you hear us? Yes, we can see you. We can still see you. Can you hear us? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Maybe so much. Oh. I can finish your novel. Okay, do you hear us? Do you hear yes. us? Maya? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So we show you now the our photographic lens, and we have here um, strong lens and uh, a movable table uh, where you place your artwork, and then you make your um, photography. Here is coming as a camera on it. So this is the overall documentation. Then you have several microscopes. This is a video microscope and um, stereo microscopes. And here's an analytical um, microscope where you make um, tests and um, rather, rather fiber samples to, to look at. So this would be our um, documentation room. Here we have our science lab. So we do prepare adhesives, but we make pH measurements. We make also light aging tests and all kinds of analytical tests. We have a lot of uh, solvents and um, chemicals to, to make tests and to, to look, for example, on solubility tests. If we have strong adhesives or different fibers, so this is our uh, science lab, which we, which we have here. In the next room, we have um, the wet conservation room. So we, uh, we, we are washing here. 
Uh, we make um, treatments like uh, introduction and alkaline reserve, or we humidify objects in this glass tube in the back. Um, in, the, in, the, in the back, you see also um, a CO2 uh, bomb, and there we alkaline, we make our water alkaline to treat paper. Uh, this is our bedroom. This, for example, is a, a suction table. So here we, um, we can put the paper on it and wash it. And it doesn't need to be moved somehow. So this is our, our third room. And we are... Um, we have two students of us, and they are just making an experiment. Uh, we have here a light aging oven, and we are working with the microscope. We are making a fiber analysis and um, and also looking at different pigments. <laughs> so this is here one of the students' um, workshop labs. Um, there's for consolidation a device, and here's already sitting four students. And uh, here are, for example, the bachelor students. Um, here we have um, another room with two gigantic uh, choir books where we are working on. They are from Naumburg. They are made out of parchment and they are from the 15th century. So they're wooden boards, um, leather, and this torn edges need to be restored um, like, like here. And they're very heavy and very big and very time consuming. Here, for example, we have an historic parchment done and which we will do in the next uh, three weeks again to prepare parchment with units. Oh. Here now we are in the we are in the in the, in the room that we we provided for um for our demonstration and uh, this is the big conservation lab is for all students. Okay. Okay. So here I wanted to show. Hmm. Um, Okay, here we wanted to show um, different tools. So what's very important for a paper conservers is that you have a lot of uh, brushes. So here these are small brushes for, for testing something. Uh, these brushes you use for pigment consolidation uh, and here to, uh, to go onto it, bit, onto it a little bit if you have something to, to, put, to put down. So these are the, the brushes. Then you can also measure the thickness of paper. This would be, um, make you make this, this device here. So very fine. And here's a micrometer um, uh, um, 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 measuring area. And um, well, here you have all kinds of, of scissors, uh, spatulas, um, brushes again. And here, this is also very important. You have um, um, uh, scissors and um, um, we have to set, um, uh, and uh, and needles to put something down, and all, all kinds of sh of sh of shapes you can you can have. 
Um, if you work with brushes, it's for, uh, very important that you put them on a stand so that they don't uh, wash. So you can use these um, uh, these little pieces from 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 the kitchen, quasi, to to work with. Uh, what's also very important is the yeah, this um, this Heidemann spatula. So if you have to put something down uh, or to look at something, for example, here you want to look at this or this un, 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 underneath this artwork. So you always lift it with the with the help, or you use uh, this here. So you normally you don't touch it with the bare hand, but with a, a plastic uh, spatula. Here they are the bamboo spatulas. Which you can also use. A very nice material is also the, the is also the um, um, Teflon uh, spatula. This is a very big one, but they, this you can um, um, shape yourself as well. So this is a, a piece of of, of um, Teflon which then can be shaped. You need to protect yourself because it's quite toxic. Um, and here, what I've already said, this is a, a whole range of um, Japanese papers which you see, and they are normally sorted um, according to the to this um, weight. So this is a rather a soft, lightweight um, a Japanese paper, and uh, this is a, really, a little bit thicker one. You see them here. Uh, this is a gumpy. So this is. It's a, another, it's a shiny, a, a shiny or a, also a, um, a little glossy um, characteristics. Um, and this is a very lightweight um, a material which you use, for example, if you have to go over it or over a little tear or something. This is at the moment the lightest uh, Japanese paper we do have on the market. It's 1.6 gram per square meter. So this is very lightweight and fabulous for going over um, an artwork, if you go also over writing, for example, if you have to restore something with the writing, you can glue it over it, you, and you, you normally you don't see it. So this is the lightest um, Japanese paper, which is on the market at the moment. Okay, um, here I wanted to show you just a, a kind of range what you can have as, as materials. So here, this is a colored material. It's um, it's a, a printed um, artwork. So you always want to know what do you have as a technique. And then we can look at a little uh, microscope. And um, so it's very important to know what's the what's the paper, what's the paper like, what's the medium like. Can I wash it? How can I treat it? Do I need to remove it? So these are the questions you have if you look at such an artwork. Here you see, for example, the edges, they're kind of dirty, so you want to, to clean them. So these were the first steps in looking at the artwork. This is uh, still framed, which you see, it's still uh, covered, but I wanted to show you. So this could be, here it's not a, a printing technique, but it's a, a watercolor. So this you see on the way how it is applied. Uh, it's also handwritten, it's not uh, like printed like here. Um, and you also have an old glass. This is a, a glass from the time it might be, as you see on the, on the very irregular surface. And um, it would be very nice to keep that glass. This is a, a quality parameter for this artwork. So very important to keep the old glass and not to break it. Um, here again, you have rather printed materials. This is not written uh, like this one, but this is uh, printed. And then uh, it would be the question, it's still closed. So here would be the, class, the question if you want to lift it or how do you work with this uh, material? This is, for example, a modern class. This is, this is an old one. This is a modern class. And you would also need to repair the frame. So this is also very important. And on the back, um, you have a handwritten uh, writing, so this needs to be protected. You want to keep it with the object, and you would also need to look at the um, at the adhesive tapes here. What what to do with them if you want to keep them or how to treat it? Um, here, for example, we this is a modern um, printed material. 
Yeah, it's from 1977. Actually, I think there's not so much to do. It's a modern class. It's a little bit cockled, but this is fine for, for an art paper. And it's, well, it's purely from the 70s. It has a, a, a bad backing, so this could be removed from with a better quality cardboard. But apart from that, the paper is quite nice. Um, this would be another. Um, object, um, this has this paper, normally you leave them with the, with the um, object, but they have, for example, here you see, um, you have here a stain, this might be out of fungus or a water drop. It's a very fine um, uh, printing technique, um, but, but very good to conserve because there's no, no color like, like with this object. So if it's black and white, it's normally easier than if you have red, blue, or, or brownish colors. So this is easier to conserve than this here, for example. Here would be the, the difficulty to, if you want to conserve it or want to keep it. And here you also see um, an, an offset from the um, uh, printing ink to the protecting paper. This is also a very common uh, um, work of art on paper. You have here something, um, you, have, you have tears, there are holes, but it's a good rag paper, good old rag paper. It's before seven, 1700, so you would need to look at it when it is um, printed. But this is a very um, old fashioned handmade rag paper. It has some uh, physical damages, some, some tears like here, um, and here some water stains, but it's very, very good to, <clears throat> to treat. If you, are, um, if you look at artwork, you always want to have good classes. So either you, you have your own classes or you use um, higher magnification and therefore you have this, this, um, this um, mag magnification, um, glasses and you always need them to detect the printing technique. So you can use these ones or you can also use these ones on the on the head. This can be also normally they have five times magnification which, which is normally enough to, to look at an artwork. Another way of looking for um, objects is with a real microscope or microscope or with these Dino lights. These are little handy USB devices, have a quite good magnification of about uh, 200. And they are very good to, they're very handy and can be good uh, use for it. Um, here, I wanted to show um, an artwork which is already restored. This is um, also a, a print. This is a lithography. And um, here there was a tear. So the tear is closed. Here are also tears. They are also closed. And here are little um, paper infills are, are performed here. Yes, you see the, the modern paper is infilled here inside. And here also the, the edge is redone, you see it also here, this, uh, this area is redone. So this is an example for a um, um, successful paper conservation work. And then I now wanted to show you the, um, how to cut these papers with, um, with this water cut. So you always have the possibility to cut a, 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 um, a paper like uh, cutting it. But cutting means that you have a quite um, hard edge here. So if you imagine that you glue it here onto it as a hinge, so you have a, a kind of a step. So this you want to avoid. And therefore, therefore you make a, a water cut. And you to do that, you, you take a little a brush and you put water on it. This is now a relatively strong. Um, paper, and then you can tear it. So you don't cut it, but you tear it. And then you have a very soft edge, um, which you see here, a very soft edge. You have this fiber standing up, so this is very good. And if this is still too much fibers, you can even cut these 
fibers away. And uh, another way is um, to use a pointer. And um, to make it not as wet, Ah, this was a little dirty. This is this gives another kind of edge. This is now rather stronger and smaller fibers, which you see here. So you have these kinds of ways of cutting Japanese paper uh, to realize a soft edge area. And um, here are two um, books which are very well, which shows this very well. So this is conservation mounting for prints and drawings. And you, you see all these kinds of techniques, how to make a mount, how to, to, to flatten the edges. And this is very well described and very, very well done. This is another work from the same group of authors. Um, I don't know if this is the right one. Uh, all kinds of um, mounting and um, and all kinds of mountings and um, um, hinging systems are described here. Very good uh, pictures to to redo it. This is uh, art on paper, mounting and housing, and conserving um, for prints and drawings. Another idea is you can make the hinges out of this, or sometimes you can also use this pre-prepared um, paper. This is a paper which has an, an glue on it. And if you um, wet it here, the, it becomes uh, sticky and you can mount it. The Japanese paper version is always preferred to this one. However, sometimes um, you want to use um, this way. And then you have again the hard edges and you have it. And um, if you have here this, this um, mount materials and you use it for mounting. Normally you can brush adhesive on it, but you can also put the adhesive by stamping on it because you don't want to have too much adhesive here on the on the paper. So here would be your weed starch. You take weed starch, you stamp it and then you apply it as a you apply it as a as a mount. This is not too big but it's um, as a, just to have an idea about diminishing the amount of adhesive. Here we have um, a whole, um, for the students, we have a whole set of um, examples how um, artwork can be mounted. So this would be a kind of hinging system where this is your artwork, there you have um, a mount or a passepartout and there's, here are some um, um, paper strips. Uh, this would be an area where um, where the strips are, um, are laced through. Here, um, I have to see the common. Okay, now here is the common Faufelsen. Here you see them um, in this area. These are uh, Melinex strips, very easily folded. Um, where you can see this is very common for photographies, for example. And um, here you have an uh, this is a T hinge where you have from the from the back to the front and then the T a T a barrier on top of it and you have here um for taking it in your hands um a Japanese paper strip. Um, this is um durch, durch, um, laced through Japanese paper strips, so through the paperboard. It's, it's very tough. You can't, you can't um, lift it somehow. And, um, and this is the V um, strips. Uh, this is, you know, here's the whole area. The whole object is is uh, mounted with false margins. And put around. And here, here also this uh, paper, uh, paper uh, folded paper pieces where the artwork is those sitting there. And here you have a whole um, 
piece of Japanese paper um, where the, the artwork is laced in. So these are just a, a short range of possibilities that you, what you can have to mount your, your artwork. Um, I will then um, uh, show you a little bit, um, if you have an artwork and it's, um, for example here you have something and you want to start with a dry cleaning, um, you have um, your artwork, so this is a very dirty mount, I'm not quite sure to, to keep that or not. Um, So first you want to look at it, um, how is it mounted? So it's not very um, good uh, mounting strips. They're brown and they're from craft paper. And also the whole object is quite red. The next thing is you to see that it's cut. It's only a part of the object and you have very strong light damages. So here's a strong light damage and only here starts the real object. So the object is from here. From the, the print is here, but this here is from an, an um, light um, damage. If you want to have any, if you want to make any dry cleaning, then first you need to know what kind of technique you do have. So this is definitely um, a printing technique. So therefore you use your microscope and it's uh, colored. So you have the red, blue, and the, the pink uh, color. And if you make any kind of, <coughs> dry cleaning. The first thing is always to go, go over it with, with a soft brush. Not rubbing over it, but with a soft brush. And then you can um, start with these uh, sponges. You can, you can cut them and use them as such. And here also, you never go over the illumination or the, or the, the face of, a, of an object, but only go around. And here you also not go like this, but you always push and turn it a little bit. And there you can see if something, um, you can take up something. So you never go over the printing because this is um, an Intaglio printing and it has a, a body, it, is, it has a relief. So you go over it and try to take up um, some, some dust. Um, it's not coming so much off, so this is not too, too dirty, no, this is fine. Okay. This looks quite a little bit, you see here, a little bit, but it's not too much. So this is rather not an, a contamination on top of the paper, but inside the paper. So here you would think about uh, perhaps an aqueous treatment to reduce the staining here, because this is due to the opening of the a window match and um, should be it's a, it's a strong it's a, it's a very strong damage okay um, then we have uh, another topic uh, we wanted to look at um, at a little a sort of um, different kinds of classes or perspex classes and this is from the company um, True View these are the, the, the the most, um, the strongest company at the moment um, for Perspex classes. And they have all kinds of, uh, kinds of, of variations. Um, so UV, a standard UV protection, as it's, it's, it's all, they are all acrylic uh, classes. Then they are clear, then they're some, uh, also reflective. So you have all kinds of variations and actually you need to, to look in your own institution, what kind of class you need. Um, also what thickness, for example, and how strong the protective uh, should be. Actually, so the, these are just the same, but I just um, took it here. And there is nearly no, um, there, there are all variations and there's open, open end in variety and also below, of course, also the costs, um, what you can um, do. So it's um, definitely, you have here a, a much higher range of UV protection. So it's 99% instead of, instead of here. So uh, this, we, you will see that also in the, the price, if you then, uh, 
actually then buy it and look for it for them for your object. And here's a very and, and a come a new um, book coming out, a museum lighting, a guide for conservators and curators uh, from David Saunders. This is a whole source of new information. It's I think it's from 2020 or 21. So this is really the latest uh, publication on museum and museum lighting. And oh no, it's 2019, but this is a great source of information. Everything about light, about effectiveness, um, just light sources, but also in all ways of how to protect your, your artwork and how to, um, to present your, your artwork. Yes. Um, these are just some more um, dry cleaning materials. So they're not too, they, they shouldn't be used these ones, for example, because they're too yellow. There's a difficulty if it stays into the paper. And um, this one is a, it's, it's a better range because it's higher. Um, this is for special um, areas. This is a, a, creep, a, a creep eraser. This is if you have a self um, so, uh, pressure sensitive tapes, then you use these, then you use these creep erasers. And this is a whole box of historical dry cleaning uh, materials, which we don't use anymore, but it's for the students, it's very good to learn the old fashioned ways of cleaning and to reflect to nowadays. Okay. So nowadays we use um, here these uh, white, um, um, erasers, they are PVC and uh, with a high content of calcium carbonate, so this is a durable. Um, or we use the, um, here these um, latex sponges, which, which are a little bit softy, but there's no, never something going off. So there's never the danger that particles from the sponge going into my paper, because as we've learned in the beginning, paper is a very vulnerable open uh, material. And what I also would like to show you, this is a very easy way of um, um, building up um, um, a kind of dry cleaning box. You just have a big sheet of, on, of paper and uh, you can build up your little box because you don't want to spread your upcomings in the whole lab. And therefore, um, you have a flat sheet of paper, and then you you, you turn it into a into a, a dry cleaning box, which can be stored. Then, it's, uh, if you have remnants or um, surplus of your dry cleaning material, just throw it away. So these are the what the, the idea of a dry cleaning box, a reversible recycled dry cleaning box. Okay. Um, so we have 15 minutes left. Perhaps um, I would go perhaps in the other room again and mm -hmm. see you there in a minute. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Marlene, for guiding me. Спасибо большое, Андрея. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this tour and the very interesting presentation of the whole gigantic scope of work and the decree of detailization it was just nice uh, and pleasant to look at we're looking forward to seeing andrea at the place where she can hear us but it was very interesting to hear some practical life hacks uh, and of course thank you very much andrea for recommending the literature specifically for uh, lighting and working with light in the museum. We had a major discussion in one of the webinars when the speaker couldn't provide an, a full answer, but I believe uh, the very interesting literature you recommended, I think those who asked those questions about lighting will see this webinar, uh, the, the recording of it, and can look into that literature and uh, receive answers they were searching for. We don't have too many questions, but we have Agul Khlapova uh, from the UNESCO Cluster Bureau uh, is asking, which museums do you work with? And let me clarify right away, to what extent is it really possible? Will it be possible 
for museums from our region of Central Asia, from South Caucasus, can they approach you uh, saying uh, we have an object where we will we seek technical assistance? How can we discuss uh, cooperation or some joint collaboration? Do you have such precedents generally? Uh, it is understood that there may be instruments or technical conditions uh, uh, that can be complied with here locally. But the most difficult part for me is the human capacity and the level of professionalism that cannot be reached very easily and quickly. And I believe that working with the leading uh, research centers like your place in Cologne uh, would be very important for our museum workers. So if you could please say how open you are to cooperation and what would be the best way to approach you about that? I mean, here we, co we are locally, we cooperate with the museums in the area. So this is at the, the Richard Wallraff Museum. Um, I mean, more or less all museums here in the area because also many of our students, they work there now. So we have a good um, cooperation network. And yeah, we are always open. I mean, we, we have an, um, we have just been in Georgia. We have, we had um, with the Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry in Germany, we had an, um, an, a project in, in Georgia, in uh, Tbilisi, and we will continue this. We, we, we handed in another grant, and we are always open. I mean, there are lots of mobility grants in Germany. We, we, need, to, we need to special um, ideas. So you say we would like to have a seminar or a webinar. And we can manage, we can, we are always for everything. So for example, Marlene Bernkin, which you have known, she just started her PhD and she, she, she wants to develop um, a framework of teaching, especially in country, countries like you are. Um, perhaps not always that we are coming because it, this we have learned from Corona that we have a, a model of teaching models or, or packages which we can transfer. So in, in this will be a kind of a Zoom, a kind of video um, presentations like I've done it and then perhaps from time to time you can come also. So this would be a, a kind of a mixture or we say blended learning or blended teaching um, for uh, countries who are not uh, who, are, who are far away. And I'm always open for any kind of projects and I mean, Write an email, and we uh, we can. We are, I'm happy if you forward the, the contact, and we're happy to cooperate to give um, to give literature, to give uh, examples, and um, yes, we are always open for any kind of cooperation or further teaching. Thank you. And for me, uh, I can say that the UNESCO Cluster Bureau in Almaty, uh, should any uh, museum organizations in the Caucasus or Central Asia, should you need any help, any logistical assistance of how to contact such centers uh, when it comes to paper, uh, art objects and textile, art objects. Uh, last time we had the representative from the Glasgow University. Please do talk to us as well. Uh, mm -hmm. While I see there are no other questions, I would like to remind that the webinar recording will soon be available on our uh, YouTube channel. And I would request, Andrea, if you could please also send the presentation you shared today. We will be forwarding it to all the registered participants. Now, mm -hmm. does anybody else uh, have questions? If you do not want to write in chat, you can ask verbally. Well, perhaps everything was clear and understandable. Uh, it was most definitely interesting. And then uh, we are ready to round up today's webinar. And for me, I can only add that this is not the last event to improve qualification of museum associates. We will have a next webinar planned for tomorrow from 2 to 2.30 Almaty time. In June, we have at least one webinar planned. Uh, the announcement will come 
in a little while. Now, Carlos or Andrea, do you want to say anything in conclusion, please? Now is the opportunity. If not, uh, we're ready to finalize. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to um, to thank you, the whole group. Wait, uh, I've written it down. Thank you very much, all of you, for organize for organization and these great contacts. I'm always curious to 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 share information and to to learn from you as well from your institutions. And thank you also to. Um, uh, Eduardo, Carlos Eduardo Serrano and Marlon Bernkin. And I'm very happy that I had the opportunity to, to be here and I'm always open for further projects or anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, since uh, we are thanking all technical specialists, we also would like to thank our interpreters who are helping us Again, uh, uh, with the museum topic, thank you, interpreters. Carlos, did you want to say anything? Yes, uh, well, I want to thank again the UNESCO office, uh, Gül Mayer, for, for all this work. I mean, I think uh, this was a fantastic webinar. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Marlene, for your support. I think it was very good, very complete, uh, and it was very interesting to see the the space, all, all this demonstration, and, and also to share some, uh, some bibliography that, that people can use. And, and yes, and I like that people would be interested on in continue like being in touch with Andrea. And I think that's the, the main idea of this kind of webinars. It's not only the information that we uh, provide, but also the, the creation of networks. Yes, yes, of course. So, yeah. And thank you uh, all, uh, to all the team of, uh, uh, UNESCO office and the translator. It was, uh, I think, it was great, uh, very good. Yeah.